Well, uh, Why the effort? <laughs> obviously we don't know, <laughs> but uh, I think the question is that some of the sites were sites uh, which were built in such a way that their function was not so much oriented towards farming and agriculture. This is why I say that we have to look at the different function of the site and we have different expectations. This was a site with a, you know, in, are you talking about the Roman or the Iron Age or both? Both, yeah. I think probably that there isn't a single explanation because in the Iron Age site, where we have quite, evidence of, quite a lot of evidence of mobility, we do know, I think there are many, many reasons why people may introduce animals. I think one of the things that has been suggested is in addition to trade, is that people were regularly raiding cattle from other areas and bringing them in. That's a possibility. For the Roman side, I think the way the site operated was not oriented towards farming as a different purposes, and, and this is why they, they needed to introduce animals from elsewhere, and probably they exported something else. Okay, I guess we can you know, talk more during the discussion uh, at the end of the session. Um, now we move to uh, a challenge in terms of uh, um, so, Alexa Laika, uh, she's going to be talking about coastal camelid herding in northern Peru, in sites from strontium and lead isotopes from Coaca, Colorado, Hecatepeque, <laughs> Yeah, it's a long, it's a long one. My, my thesis is going to be really long just for that. Um, uh, so, uh, we wanted, to, my collaborators and I wanted to thank uh, the organizers for accepting our paper um, to give uh, a different perspective from the Andes region of Peru. Um, our paper, the um, motivation behind it and the, po the point of uh, contributing it was to look at directionality in herding um, along coastal and highland routes in the Andes. Um, so just a bit of background, um, this is uh, a map depicting the concept of the vertical archipelago that was first discussed by John Moore in the 1960s. And the idea behind the vertical archipelago was that at different kin groups at different elevations in the Andes um, had a barter and trade system that allowed them to survive within their um, isolated elevations, but still gaining access to coastal and other highland area resources. So this has been focused on and in camelid herding um, over the last 30 years since uh, Jane Wheeler's work in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but work in the 80s and more recently with suggestions um, by junior scholars, uh, we need to start thinking about uh, horizontal uh, forms of movement. Uh, Izumi and Melody Shimada in, the, in 1985 in their paper discussed the idea of a horizontal archipelago, the idea that the different river valleys in the Andes would also be, um, be involved in this uh, broad trading network. Um, and then more recently by Veronika Tomsic uh, at Stanford University with her work uh, in the Warme Valley has also started to suggest this idea of horizontal movement along the coast and obviously not just movement into the highlands. Um, just a bit of background on the period of time. As the title shows, uh, we're working uh, from the period of 650 to 850 AD uh, during the Moche period. Uh, the entire Moche period spanned from 200 to 850 AD. Um, and this is a general map of where the influence was, all the way down in the Nepeña Valley, um, farther south, up close, closer to Ecuador. And this cultural period uh, is defined by uh, beautifully crafted ceramics. Um, we have uh, an amazing industry of metallurgy that's going on, um, gold and silver plated artifacts. Uh, we also have the well-known portrait and erotica pottery uh, that's known from the period of time. The uh, domestic practices um, and the details around herding have been less studied uh, so that was the motivation uh, to to address this within within uh, this region so um, the site that I'm going to focus on is the site of Waka Colorada uh, it's the largest late moche site so for 650 to 850 AD in the southern Jequitepeque Valley um, this site is uh, very important because it would have been a uh, node along trade route that reached into the um, highlands in contact with a highland culture called the Cajamarca culture. And we see um, just a huge amount of, um, of these kinds of uh, uh, ceramic vessels. Uh, these are feasting plates. 
And the central part of the site, as you can see in this topographic map, sector B, is full of these ceramics. So there's a strong tradition of uh, trade and interaction with the highland zone. So this valley goes straight up into the highlands and the Cajamarca would have been there. Um, we see variation in the, in the ceramic uh, metallurgy and other kinds of artifacts with sector B and or sector C and sector A. These two zones, uh, still elite context and similar to sector B, uh, but more production evidence. Uh, and just last year, we actually found a looted tomb in sector A. Unfortunately, uh, not a lot of remains were left behind, but we did have a beautiful um, uh, camelid, uh, a spoon made from camelid bone. Um, so there is a lot of interaction uh, across the site, uh, different uh, material patterns, um, but overarching evidence that there is uh, long distance trade with the highlands. Uh, so uh, my training uh, through the various years as still PhD candidate has been mainly zooarchaeological. And over the last few years, um, I've been uh, trying to incorporate isotopic work um, to address this idea of mobility and how far camelids are coming from to reach the site or to, to either be bred at the site and raised at the site and, and going abroad. And um, so this is just a, a quick zooarchaeological uh, graph uh, showing just how uh, common camelids were. So the domesticated uh, yama and alpaca. We do have uh, some dog uh, and deer at the site, but just overwhelmingly in all three sectors of the site, um, it's, it's very much camelid. Um, we have some interesting contexts as well. Uh, so camelids would have been part of daily practices and herding um, just from ethnographic records, but they also were important to um, ceremonial offerings at the site. Uh, so the burial at the top is of a um, uh, 20, uh, 25 year old woman with approximately with, uh, it's not present in this photo, but there was a six month old child found buried beside her. And in the same floor context, we had a juvenile camelid burial. So very important in, uh, um, in, in, in ritual practices at the site. Uh, we also have um, another young, this is a young, a young man, 16 to 18 years old, with three juvenile camelids. So very much part of this idea of offering to the site with different renovation events. Um, metallurgy would have also been important, as you can see in this copper spatula. Um, so the preservation is amazing. So we figured that with all of this, we would attempt um, to, to consider uh, uh, isotopic, isotopic work. And this is just one other example. It's important, um, I think, to mention uh, just this uh, recurring pattern of offerings. We actually also had a, the offering of a pregnant woman, um, and there were some juvenile um, uh, camelid remains found throughout her, around her body. Um, no complete skeleton, um, but this idea of, of uh, juvenile remains and, and birth was, was quite striking. Across the site, we can see that there's consistent patterns of uh, meat sharing, um, mainly within the thorax region of the site, as well as within um, the lower limb. Uh, and the age patterns in general uh, concentrate around sub-adults, um, where you would have had a lot of meat to share around. And, and this is just uh, one example, a beautiful uh, image from uh, the Spanish Chronicles that uh, indicate uh, one of the possible ways that they would have potentially uh, sacrificed camelids. Uh, by uh, creating an incision in the abdomen and potentially manually stopping the heart. So it's just there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge ethnographically um, and then some of the data um, with a lack of cut marks on a lot of the complete burials we have. Um, maybe some of these suggestions could be valid. So I want to preemptively discuss uh, some of the isotopic work um, this for the radiogenic work that we did, uh, just mentioning the stable carbon and uh, nitrogen work that has been conducted. So this is a small sample that was completed uh, last year. Um, so we were able to process, thank you, we were able to process, um, to process this data for the purpose of this presentation. And um, we mainly sampled camelid remains. These are all um, M2s, uh, if they were present. If uh, for the younger material, if we didn't have M2s, we, we dealt with M1. So obviously there might be an issue with, um, uh, with weaning signaling, um, but just bear that, bear that in mind. And we were able to also sample some of the human remains um, and the dogs. So in general, you can see it's uh, quite a strong C4 signal, in particular among the guinea pigs that we were also able to sample, um, this being from post cranium, not from teeth. Um, and uh, the human remains uh, obviously show more enriched uh, values, in particular with the dogs as well. We also do have a small group here that does look like it's a lot more of a mixed C3, C4 diet. Uh, so potentially camelids that might have been going up into the highlands, which has a stronger C3 associated diet, and then potentially coming down to the coast. So that was in some of our, our earlier interpretation. And then just also some of this preliminary uh, carbonate data um, indicating that within the local range, which is about negative one to about negative six, that the animals are um, uh, uh, 
clustered in, in, in that local sort of coastal uh, signature, um, as well as with the dogs and humans uh, situated within that. So these sort of two patterns were indicating um, mobility, potentially, um, but also these, these sort of strong coastal signatures. Uh, so we wanted to see what the strontium, um, in particular lead, uh, had to say about that. So very overwhelming chart, but it really gives you a good idea of the strong differences. Uh, so just to mention the baseline work, which is what um, our team did, uh, we went around um, the site of Wapakoara and sampled from Agua Robo tree, which is mesquite tree. It's um, Persopis alba, the species name, that is common in the region. Um, and uh, records, ethnographic records have attested to hamlets potentially eating the pods from those trees. Um, so we, we figured to sample the, those plants. Um, we also sampled from agricultural fields, um, older agricultural fields that were around the site. So direct sediment from around the site, as well as water from um, stationary lakes in uh, algal robo forest nearby the site. So this is the, the local baseline for immediate, immediately around Huapa Colorada. And I, I listed just the ranges just for your reference because the numbers are quite small. Um, so the local baseline um, is the first line listed there. Previous work in other parts of the Andes have shown that the general coastal range is uh, 0.705 to 0.708, and highland ranges are usually 0.71 and higher. So you can see from this pattern, the humans and the dogs that we were able to analyze for strontium overwhelmingly are a lot more from the southern Hecatepeque Valley. Um, that being said, they can't necessarily be from other regions. It's possible, um, but just within this local range. And then we have a majority of the camelids falling within that sort of general coastal pattern and with only really a few coming or coming or going from highland areas. Um, so it's a very strong difference if we also compare dogs and humans, um, which we figured was a, a very interesting comparison, considering some of the human burials I showed you are from uh, foundation offerings, so not from a formal cemetery. So being able to interpret what the camelers are doing and infer about where the people are going maybe isn't the best idea. So we figured direct um, assessment was better. Um, among the lead work that we did, again, this, this uh, baseline sampling we did around the site directly, we were able to get um, lead isotope ratios from those uh, just as a, as a point of, um, not necessarily of contention, but there's not a lot of isotope work, uh, lead isotope work done in the Andes. There's a few papers that have been published, but we wanted to attempt to extract that to start building uh, uh, the database up, in the, especially in the north where no lead isotope work has been done. Um, and in general, it's, there's a similar pattern being seen among some of the humans and camelids uh, that the lead is also indicating non-local origin. So getting back to this idea of directionality, uh, we know from the uh, dietary uh, uh, information that was provided by carbon and nitrogen from the collagen in particular, as well as uh, from uh, the carbonates, that um, there was an enrichment in, in nitrogen values to a degree and also a lot more C4 contribution. But this C4 contribution doesn't necessarily have to mean that it was from uh, maize or corn or even amaranth or uh, what is known as kuicha in the Andes, which are C4 plants, could have been from this coastal, uh, this coastal vegetation, which are also C4 plants. And if we think about the constant mobility along the coast, if we think about the um, spread of moche influence along specifically along the coast, camelids might have been one of the means for this, uh, this ideology, this stylistic practice to have spread and to have persisted for 600 years. Um, so I will leave you with acknowledgements. Thank you to our funding bodies. Thank you to the organizers. Um, and yes, any questions you have.